Yes. And I have the privilege to introduce our, our guest speaker, Mr. Fong Ho. Uh, so a little bit about him. He is a University of Alberta graduate, Canadian Alberta. Uh, and uh, his first, actually his first uh, co-founded uh, startup was in 2002 called iMedia Magic. And then for the next four years, he had a plethora of different experiences. And it ranges from working at Microsoft to being continuing being a ski instructor, to be a software developer, uh, and also as a as a tech consultant for CGI. Okay, and then it wasn't until then uh, he's he for the next seven years uh, he worked for a company called Direct Energy, and uh, he started off as a uh, I believe as a Mac, as a programmer Mac developer. And, and then he kind of rose up the, the ranking to be a manager. And his last role in that company, he, he moved all the way down to Houston, Texas to be the, uh, the head of North America Gas Loading Forecasting. What a title. <laughs> I have no idea what that means. But uh, I hope uh, maybe in that, today's conversation we'll, we'll learn about that. And in the corporate world, you know, I think that's where he developed and really refined his leadership skills his management skills, his ability to motivate a team, uh, vision, and also, you know, even like corporate culture. I think he uh, he has a very strong uh, skill in developing that in a positive way. It wasn't until like maybe 2013 he started his next, his second uh, startup company called Rally Team, where he had to go from Houston, Texas, all the way to San Francisco for the next for three years, I think, yeah. For the next three years, he built, he wrote this, he built and wrote the software, built the team, started a business, got funding, and then got acquired in 2018 by uh, Workday. And at Workday, he has his his team here, part of his team here, supporting him. Uh, so that's an indication of what type of uh, leader and manager he is, where his. His team actually does come and support. <laughs> so that's, a, that's an indicator of what we're going to be uh, exposed to and the energy that he carries. So thank you very much. Please bring your uh, round of applause. Yeah, that was fantastic. Oh man, I wanted to like bring you in for all the other intros. I like, <laughs> you know, I'll put higher. <laughs> all right, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so you know, the first time we met, you know, we talked uh, a lot about you know, your journey of Rally Team. Yep. But I'm the type of person who likes to go into like, the origins and like how did this spark even happen? Okay. You know, so we had a great conversation about vision, mission, and purpose. Yeah. And just something that you're very passionate about. And actually, even when you start a Rally Team, it is to align people's mission, vision, and purpose within the corporation. Right. So how did you do it for yourself? Uh, for myself? So for me, when I graduated university, is from computer engineering, and um, I worked for a different, a few different gigs, as you mentioned. And um, in my last role, um, I asked myself, well, my my mentor asked me, when you're 80 years old and you look back at your life, what story do you want your grandkids? Mm -hmm. And at that time, you know, I didn't have a good story. I was working in the trading floor, uh, making good money, uh, but really the only story I could tell them was buy low, sell high, and that's not a very inspiring story that you want to tell your grandkids <laughs> or your kids, right? I wanted to do something with more purpose. I wanted to do something that was going to change the world. And then, so I started reflecting back on my career and asked myself, what sort of impact do I want to make? What was impactful for me? And at every job that I had, I felt like I always hit a ceiling, right? I wanted to do more, I wanted to learn more, but at that organization, I couldn't find the right opportunities or I didn't know who to talk to. So what do you normally do? You start you know, going on Monster or LinkedIn and looking for new opportunities. And so I kept jumping from job to job because I always hit that ceiling. And then at my last company, I, I met a lot of people who were disengaged, right? And one guy, very smart guy, had a PhD, but had been doing the same job over and over again. And um, every day he came in and he was always complaining about work, how much he hated work. Um, and then finally one day he had a heart attack. And I said, holy crap, like that's this is a serious problem. And then when I started looking into it, you know, I found out that 75% of Americans are disengaged. And I'm like, that's, that's an epidemic. Mm -hmm. Th three out of four people you know should not be spending half their lives unhappy, right? So that's when I decided, you know what, that's the problem I want to solve. 
Oh, I don't know if I answered your question, but I talked about something. No, I think I, you know, I'm just going to throw my book away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's just freestyle. Like. No, it's, uh, you know, when you talk about vision and, and purpose, you know, like, if someone were to come up to you today, yeah. who is you know, in the thick of things of their lives, how would you help them figure out what they are supposed to do? I think what I would do is just basically have a conversation with them and just ask them, you know, what's meaningful to them, right? Or what's important to them? And I'd ask them the same thing. Mm -hmm. When you're 80 years old, what do you want to tell your grandkids, right? Another good exercise that I've done in the past is write your own eulogy, right? Mm -hmm. So when you die, right, what do you want people to talk about, about you, mm -hmm. right? And then, and then look at your life and ask yourself, are you actually doing those things, right? If not, what are the things you need to do right now in order to like make that story happen? Yeah, like what's interesting about you is when you shared the story of you figured out what you wanted to do and then you had to, it was such a real thing that you had to act on it. Yeah. Like, and you had some, you have a great story behind that. Like how did you, how did you go from Texas to yeah. San Francisco? Like, yeah. Seriously? So I had, I had, I was in the corporate world, you know, making decent money and I had the golden handcuffs. It was tough. And I had been telling my wife for the last two, three years that I want to do a startup, I want to do a startup. And finally she's like, okay, stop talking about it and actually do it. But it, gets, it, it, was, it was difficult because at the time I was getting promoted. Um, the company I was working at had uh, put me into MBA school. I was doing my MBA, they were paying for it all. And so I was like, oh man, this is really hard to leave. Um, and then finally there was a hackathon. I joined the hackathon, um, won it. And that's when I got my, that's really when my creative juices and startup juices started flowing again. And two weeks, three weeks after the hackathon, I decided to quit my job, quit my MBA, jumped on my motorcycle and just do it. Moved out to San Francisco and started up Rally King. And I think that's, that's very hard for people who've started down their career path, right? Yeah. To be able to like walk away from something pretty good and basically take a leap and start from the bottom up. Yeah. Right, I moved up to San Francisco. I didn't know one person. Yeah. I didn't know one person. I had to build up a network there. And as you know, I was couch surfing for two years because yeah. I was I had a budget that I had to stick, stick with in order to last two years over there. So where was your wife? So she <laughs> rode on a, yeah, so that's an interesting story. So she rode on a motorcycle from uh, Houston to San Francisco with me on her own motorcycle. It was a great adventure. We did it in 10 days. And then when we, she got there, um, we shipped her bike back. She stayed for about two days and then uh, she headed back. And I still remember that night when I got to, uh, uh, I was in San Mateo actually, just south of San Francisco. That yeah. night when she left, it was the first night I was alone yeah. in some random person's house on their couch, <laughs> right? Thinking, holy shit, what did I just do? <laughs> like, I just quit a job. I was living in a really nice condo in Houston, like work with all these NBA players, a really nice condo. And now I'm sleeping on this couch with a single mom and two kids, right, in San Mateo, jobless, and not really sure what not really sure what I'm doing. Right? And I actually like call my mom. I'm like, mom, I think I might have made a mistake. I think I might have made a mistake. And my mom, she's always been supportive, right? She's like, you know what, don't worry, you'll always figure things out. And what's, the reason why I talk to my parents is because it reminds me of their journey, right? Um, I was born in Vietnam, and during the time they had to escape Vietnam, they escaped on a boat, they were one of those boat people. And my parents always say, you know, when they escaped Vietnam, they were on a boat, and their boat was sinking as they were escaping. No way. Yeah, because it, it had got shot. And they were getting like basically chased out of Vietnam. It was sinking and eventually sunk. They got stranded on an island, right? And I was maybe like a year or two old at oh the time. Gosh. And so whenever I think about that, I'm like, what's the worst that could happen? I go out to San Francisco, my startup fails. I go back to the corporate world in a cushy job. <laughs> not that bad. It's not like I'm escaping the country that I grew up in, yeah. going out into the middle of the ocean in the middle of the night with a little newborn, right? Yeah. So I'm like, that's not that bad. Yeah, I know. It's like, and you also had like some crazy stories when you were there. Like, you gave yourself two years. Yeah. Right. You're living on the couch. Yeah. Like, how did you? How did you not feel like you should give up? Like, obviously, you were you you were thinking. Yeah. Of the past. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's why. 
for me at least, and what I tell other entrepreneurs is do something you're passionate about. Like there's some other like stuff out there on the internet about people talking about do what you're good at. It doesn't necessarily have to mean it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be passionate about it. I truly believe you need to be passionate about it because there's so many nights, right, where I'm running out of money, right? I'm eating ramen, I'm sleeping on a couch, and I'm thinking, why the hell am I doing this? Yeah. Right? I can go back to Houston right now and go back to the, my, my old job and you know live a comfortable life. But it's that passion, it's that drive, it's that in original vision and mission that I'm gonna actually change the world with this software, yeah. right? And you, that is priceless, right? Yeah. And that's what kept driving me forward. So here's a, here's a little bit of a personal question. Yeah. Where do you think your compassion for people came from? Hmm. You know, I never thought I would want to be a people leader. It's not something I, I thought I wanted to do because you know, in university, when I went to computer engineering, I thought, you know, I'm gonna be this really great engineer building self-driving cars. Um, and I was gonna stay very technical. I was just more focused on myself. Although that said though, one of my, my jobs throughout university was coaching skiing. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the best jobs. Um, I love seeing people grow. I ran a kids club as well. So I love seeing kids grow. But I never translated that into, I wanna be a people leader or people manager one day. It was just something that, I was like, oh, it's probably because I like ski. That's why I like coaching mm -hmm. all these people. And then while I was in the workforce, working in the corporate world, uh, I got my first gig as a manager at the time. And, um, you know, I, I just saw it as a promotion. But then as I started like managing and growing people and the group that I took over, they kind of gave me like the shit. Like, when I moved into this role, they were like, okay, this group has the worst, the worst engagement, the highest turnover, and they work on the worst projects. Uh, they don't even really work on projects, they just click buttons and copy and paste all day. And so I just, I took on that group. And the first thing I did was I want to transform it. I want to like turn it into like, you know, one of the most highly engaged groups. I want to get them working on cool projects. So I did kind of like a root cause analysis. It's funny because like the, when I first took on the team, there was, it was only three people. And the first day I started, two of them put in their two week notice. I was like, oh my God, you guys really screwed me on this. <laughs> And so I did an exit interview with those two people yeah. just to understand why they left. And then um, I put together a plan. I said, okay, well, these are the reasons why they left. We got to do something about each one of these things. So I put together a strategy to address each one of their concerns. Uh, I hired some more people in. And basically after um, I was a manager of that team for five years, the team grew. Uh, I ended up taking over the U.S. team as well. And in those five years, they didn't have one person quit on me. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I, the one thing I, I realized out of that was I loved seeing people grow. I love seeing people coming into work and happy more than any of like the work I've done in the past. Mm -hmm. Right? I used to love building cool software, but then it was incomparable to like seeing people grow and come in happy to work. And that's when I decided, you know what? This is kind of like I think what I'm good at and what I'm passionate about. Mm -hmm. I still like building software and all that, but I'd rather see other people. Um, build software and grow and develop and mm -hmm. achieve their dreams. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> obviously it sounds like the love that you have for people growing mm -hmm. was what kept you on that couch. Right. Is that a safe assessment? <laughs> <laughs> Were you talking about a couch <laughs> surfing? Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's, it's several things. I think um, the impact that it was going to have on the world, right? Just building a team. Because like, at that time I didn't have a team, it was just me. And I think it's just like the vision of knowing that one day this software is going to you know, impact people and hopefully help them grow in an area that they're passionate about. Oh, that's pretty cool. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm going to shift into the, the, this phase, which is the sacrifice and the determination oh, yeah. and the courage that it took you. Mm -hmm. So in a startup community, uh, if you were to... If you encounter another uh, entrepreneur who wants to do a startup, yeah. what cost and sacrifice do you think that person would need to make that you had to do for yourself right. to come to success? Right, yeah, I think a lot of times when you read about startup successes and entrepreneurs, you hear kind of like the, the happy ending, you hear about like the good stuff in the, the journey, you hear about all the cool stuff, like I was in TechCrunch, I went to this accelerator, we got funding, it's all great, but there's definitely a lot of sacrifices that you have to make. So at the time, you know, my wife, 
she kind of married me knowing that I had a good career and everything, right? <laughs> so then um, we moved out to Houston, and she had to quit her job, okay? Quit her job, moved out to Houston, and I was basically kind of breadwinner until she got her working visa, and then she started working again as well. And But I was the one who was bringing most of the income, and so we had a, uh, a certain level of life, and her idea was like, you know, we're gonna move down there, we're gonna have kids right away, and then we're gonna start a family, she's gonna be a mom, all that. And then I was like, I'm gonna quit my job and move to San Francisco. <laughs> she was not happy, right? Um, but she knew it was something that was important for me. And, um, you know, I, I just had my first kid, my daughter, a year and a half ago. And I look back sometimes, I'm like, I do wish I had kids like six years ago when I started the company, right? So that's definitely a sacrifice I had to make. And then on top of that, you know, while I was in San Francisco making no money, right, my wife was in Houston supporting herself and also supporting me at times as well, mm -hmm. right? So she, we were doing long distance for two years and it definitely like, you know, tested our relationship, yeah. right? And I think I told you the story, like for me, one of the hardest parts of the journey was I came back to Houston. Uh, there was a period where I didn't see her for three months and then I came back to Houston to visit her and I remember getting into my condo that day and like I was like Rochelle hey I'm home right and I go in there and to give a, a little bit of backstory one of the things that my wife Rochelle loves is to she doesn't she's not a very pretentious person she doesn't wear brand new clothes but the one thing she absolutely loves is going to the salon and getting her hair done like maybe every three months or something right and it's like come home I, uh, I look around like she's not here I go into the washroom and she was there cutting her own hair and at that point, I was like, oh my God, I feel like such a terrible husband. I can't even afford to like, you know, send my wife to get her hair cut, right? And I was just like, I am so sorry. I promise you, if this thing does well, you will not have to work again. You can just be at, be at home and be a mom. So, and she's a mom right now. <laughs> like, um, you also shared in the two years when you were in San Francisco, you faced a lot of obstacles, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. A lot of uh, validation issues. Oh yeah. Right. And um, why don't you share how was that? How did that two years shape your outlook in, in your job, in your career, in your yeah. team? How did that? How did that affect you? Yeah, I feel like from that experience, I really do feel that if one person has done something, I can do that. Like anything is possible, right? If there's somebody in the world has, that has done this, I know that with the right dedication and hard work, you can do it as well, right? Because there are so many times out in the valley where, you know, I thought for sure we're gonna fail or I was gonna shut down. Like one example is when I first moved out to the valley, it was within a month I went to like all these networking events. Uh, I met an investor and it was an older lady, I still remember her. And um, I, I told her about my great idea. And at the time I was still in the honeymoon phase. I was so excited about it. She was like 100 years old. And she was like, <laughs> she was like, nope, that idea is never gonna work. And then I was like, right? and then I was like, why? why, why not? And she was like, well, think about it. You're a hiring manager. You hire somebody under your team. Do you think you would want to lend them out to like other teams, especially now that like resources are scarce? I was like, oh man, she's got a really good point. <laughs> I didn't see this flaw in my idea, right? And then uh, I was like, crap. You know, I'm out here going full bore on this thing, and this lady just totally poked a big hole in my ship, right? And so I was like, oh man, yeah, maybe this isn't gonna work. But again, it was that passion for like solving this problem that kept me dry moving forward. And I think that's one of the hardest things is, I worked on a trade floor. You know, I was used to pressure, I was used to a very fast-paced environment, a lot of yelling, a lot of swearing, right? Um, but this was completely different. I was not prepared for the emotional roller coaster because when you put everything you have into a startup, it's almost like having a kid. And I can say that now because I have a kid, right? And so when an investor or somebody says, oh my God, that's not gonna work. It's like someone saying, oh my God, your kid's so ugly. Right? And you're just like, oh man. But then, but then you go to the next investor and they say the same thing, your kid's so ugly. Right? So after like about 50 investors and networking events, you kind of build a thick skin. Yeah. And, if, and I think I've taken a lot of that to like my job now. It's like, you know, even today I was, um, I'm pitching this idea of getting Workday, the company I'm at right now, 
on the Great Place to Work Canada list. Yeah. And a lot of people on, um, on the meeting today, they're like, well, the deadline's in December. There's absolutely no way you can do it. And I broke it down. I'm like, no, you can do it. Let's do it, right? But for me, it's like I've kind of gone through this with my startup. I know it's possible. And I know if we just stay focused, we can do it. Whereas like other people, they're like, yeah, it's impossible. And for me, I'm like, nothing's impossible. You can always find a way to kind of like, you know, get there. So like every time you get rejected, yeah. like who did you bounce your ideas on? Like how did you pivot? Like did you do it by yourself or did you have? Yeah, so you know, every time you got rejected, after you kind of get over that, you know, personal scarring, emotional scarring, you kind of actually think about it. You're like, okay, what did they poke holes in? And then whatever they poke holes in, that became like a potential experiment for myself, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, um, the one lady said, you would, managers would never lend a resource bill. And then so I started running experience, interviewing people, interviewing like a wide range of managers. And yeah, some of the more like older managers are like, nope, I hired this person, they're my they're my resource. Yeah. But then a lot of like the newer, younger managers were like, no, I totally get it. Like, you know, I'm not gonna try and lock somebody down in my team. If they're ready to like try something new, I wanna encourage it. Yeah. And I think their system's gonna help me help give me visibility around that. Right, so there's definitely a mind shift, right? There's definitely like a paradigm shift, and that's kind of what kept me focused on building my product. Because I'm like, well, I know that the managers who are all about locking their resources down, they're on their way out, they're on their way to retirement, and it's this new batch of managers, these man younger managers that know how like the new workforce and millennials like to work, and are the ones that are gonna be using the product. So did you did you find that generation gap a big problem? Yeah, for our for our market, it was definitely a challenge because you kind of had the old guard that had a certain mindset, and then you had the new people, new leaders that had the mindset that I had, yeah. right? But the problem is like the the older managers, they're the VPs, they're the directors, they're the ones buying buying the product, right? So one thing I learned from this experience is, you know, it's good to go into a market where the paradigm shift has already happened, yeah. right? And what's what's interesting is. When I started the company six years ago, a very, um, I guess, famous thought leader in the HR space, his name is Josh Burson, mm -hmm. he, uh, he saw my product and uh, he was like, that's a fantastic product, it's gonna revolutionize the workforce. And I was like, oh sweet, if this guy's saying this, like I'm golden, right? Yeah. And then he was like, but you're five years too early. Right? Oh. And I was like, oh shoot. And what's interesting is, uh, he told me this in 2014, he just published an article in 2015 talking about exactly what Routine does and says this is one of the biggest trends for 2020. Mm. Which is interesting because he was almost bang on with the tradition. Oh. Yeah. So like, you got this feedback, emotional scarring. Yep. You bounce your idea with other managers, yep. right? Got yep. feedback from there. Yeah. Like, like, you're alone, man. Like, how did you stay productive? You know what I mean? Yeah, you kind of get into a schedule. So I had to come up. So I had a schedule of I wake up at around eight. I go into the co-working space, similar to this, at nine. I code to code until four p.m. Uh, I leave the office and go to networking events till about eight or nine p.m. Come back to the office, code from nine till midnight, and then just did that every single day for pretty much two years. Uh, seven days. Seven days a week, absolutely, because I knew that. I had saved up fifty thousand yeah. dollars. I budgeted that money for uh, basically two years in Silicon Valley, which isn't very much. That's why yeah. I was like say, living on couches yeah. and eating ramen noodles. Not the, not the nice kind. I mean, like the twenty-five cent packages. <laughs> um, and so I knew that every day I'm in San Francisco is you know X amount of dollars I've earned. Yeah. So if I you know spend that day sleeping in, watching you know TV, Netflix, that's you know one day. I just burned. That's like you know money I just burned that I could have been spending on my startup, right? So I did. I did take breaks. I had a motorcycle so every now and then. I'd go for a motorcycle ride if I needed a break. But for the most part, I was like pretty focused for two years. So, what was Rally Team's first big break? Um, I think our first big break was when we signed on um, our first big customer. Mm -hmm. That was definitely a huge milestone. Cause it was like, oh my God, like these 
people actually want to use our product, like it's actually real and they're willing to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So I'd say that was kind of like the first big break. It was like, okay, we're actually building something that, you know, a company wants to use and pay for. It. And at that time, were you still alone or did you have a... I, I had a co-founder at the time, but he was, let's say, very part-time. Mm -hmm. And actually, he ended up, we, we ended up separating uh, in very good terms. Uh, but he had just had a baby and he was basically kind of being a dad. Yeah. And I was basically on my own. But technically, I did have a co-founder at the time. So. Okay. So, like, talking about big breaks. Yeah. You know, uh, what is... You know, you talked about courage last time we we met. Yeah. But you also said you want founders to have this key ingredient, yeah. which was to hustle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, how would you define hustle? Hustle is being creative in order to set yourself from everybody else, right? And to give you I, one example, I always like to share it is so to get into accelerators, especially in the valley, it's very competitive. Like they say it's harder to get into like Y Combinator or some of these other accelerators than it is to get into Harvard, right? Because you have startups and really smart people from all over the world applying to these accelerators. And so I applied to a few accelerators, never heard back. And then there was a Microsoft accelerator that was coming up. And I was like, I really want to get into the Microsoft accelerator because their theme was all around the future of work and uh, technologies that are going to transform it. So I'm like, this is perfect for us. So I submitted my application. And I tried to find out who was the one reviewing the application, who was responsible for the program, and I would try to ping them on LinkedIn, uh, nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and then every day I follow startup news in the Valley, and uh, I saw an article about how the head of Microsoft Ventures, who was writing this accelerator program, was gonna be at Rocket Space uh, to pick one startup out of Rocket Space, right, uh, to join the accelerator. They had one spot left. And he was gonna listen to a handful of Rocket Space uh, which is kind of like a local working space as well. Uh, he was almost into just a handful of rocket space startups and pick from there. So then I did some research on LinkedIn, found out who the person organizing the event was at Rocket Space. Um, what was his name? I think his name was Kevin. Uh, so I, 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 picked, I hit him up on LinkedIn. I was like, hey, Kevin, uh, interested in learning more about Rocket Space. Uh, you free for a drink this week? And he's like, yeah, sure, man, let's connect. And so we went out for a drink. One drink led to another, right? And next thing you know, we're both drunk and uh, we're having a good time. And so I was like, hey man, I heard about this event you're throwing uh, with like Microsoft Ventures. Uh, tell me more about it. And he was like, yeah, you know, we've got like these three startups that are going to pitch. And then uh, the, the head of Microsoft Ventures is hoping to pick one of them. And I'm like, oh man, that's awesome. And then uh, he was like, hey man, like actually your startup that you were just telling me about sounds very in line with like, you know, what they're looking for. I'm like, you know, is there any way I could like pitch as well? <laughs> and then he's like, well, you're not a rocket space company. And I'm like, ah, you know, it'll just, you know, they'll probably just, you know, be another pitch that he doesn't care about anyways. And uh, he was like, okay, I'll tell you what, each startup is five minutes, I can give you three minutes. I was like, done, right? So then the day comes, the, all three startups go up there pitch, and then they, uh, Kevin's like, hey, I got one more startup, uh, he introduced me, I did my three minute pitch. And then uh, a week later, they pick my start to be part of the be part of the Microsoft entrance. So yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, that's and then it's just things you gotta kind of do to set yourself apart because everybody is hustling out there. Yeah, yeah. So like, what type of um? So now that you got this, uh, got into Microsoft. Yeah. How was that experience? Like, did you feel like you're now amongst peers, or did you feel like you're like a drop in the ocean type of thing? Like. Was it was really good. Like there was a lot of camaraderie, yeah. and Microsoft ran an excellent program. Um, they connected us to like even Satya. He came and visit visited us. We met a bunch of executives from Microsoft. They had a really well run program. Um, they gave us a bunch of like credits for Azure. Um, they gave us even some funding, and they, they didn't even take any equity. Um, and so like it was a very good experience. And I think one of the best parts was just camaraderie with other startups, mm -hmm. right? We're with other startups that were not competing with us. We we're just all there. It felt like, you know, we're going to war, we're like a unit, and we're just fighting this uphill battle. We know, we know statistically, probably 80% of us are gonna fail, yeah. but hopefully there's gonna be one or two of us that like survive this war, right? Yeah. So there was just like this inherent camaraderie to like help each other. So like when you, now the Raleigh team, you're getting exposure, yeah. uh, you got some backing, yeah. right? At what point in time did you start building a team 
and like start, you know, the, the engine is really, uh, really rumbling. Yeah, so, you know, when I first moved out to the Valley, I was thinking, I want to build this company the old fashioned way. Mm -hmm. My dad has an accounting company. He didn't raise any money. He didn't take out a loan. Um, so I'm going to do the same, right? I don't need to raise any money. I'm just going to build this company organically. And then after the accelerator, um, you know, I met with one of my, one of my um, mentors and he was like, hey, Han, you've been at this for about two years now. Uh, when you first came up here, there's not really anybody doing this idea. Now there's two companies doing it. One of which, are, uh, one company was co-founded by two Google employees, mm -hmm. right? So you're running up against this different uh, competition and I guarantee you all those startups are raising money right now. And this is gonna be one of those things where the first one across the finish line is gonna get the, the lion's share of the market, yeah. right? So then I was like, okay, well, you know what? I think this is time to start raising money, right? Even though I still had a little bit of money left, I was like, I need to scale up a team, I gotta build up an engineering team. Because at that point, I was doing sales, finance, accounting, and of course, software development, yeah. right? So I was like, okay, I need to build up an engineering team. And um, initially, the co-founder that I had, he was supposed to be CTO, yeah. and I was CEO at the time. But then he just was kind of like busy doing family stuff. So then I was initially looking for a CTO, couldn't find somebody that I really, really thought was great. So then that's when I was like, well, you know what? I'm actually probably a better CTO. And in terms of business, like there's a lot of great people out there who I can learn from. So that's when I met another co-founder of mine, this other guy, David, we met at a conference. Initially, he was just gonna be a mentor and an angel investor. Yeah. Um, but then I was like, okay, we're raising money now. Do you wanna be an angel investor? He's like, sure, I love your idea. And then after some back and forth, I was like, hey, you know, I'm looking for a co-founder as well. Would you like to join as CEO, right? And he was like, oh yeah, you know what? Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm looking to do a startup, so I'd love to. Yeah. So then uh, we, he joined as CEO and then um, we went out and raised money and within about three or four months raised about eight, eight and a half million dollars. Oh. And then after that, just um, started growing the team. Yeah. yeah. And then, so we're getting, how, how early on was the raising of the $8 million to like getting acquired by, by Microsoft? Uh, by Workday, yeah. So, oh, sorry, by, by Workday, yeah, yeah. sorry. So we, so I had been working on reality for two years and then I met David and then we went out to raise, we actually only went to raise $2 million, mm -hmm. but then the, the investment firm came back and was like, we absolutely love your idea. We don't want you to worry about money for the next couple of years. We're gonna give you eight and a half million. And it was really good terms at the time. So we're like, you know what? This is actually a really good deal. We're gonna take it. Yeah. And so we took the money, grew the team, hired a bunch of people, um, started refining the product, getting more customers. And about three years after we raised, um, Workday came and bought us. So have you ever talked to Workday and what they saw in you? Uh, yeah, they were pretty upfront about what they saw in us, yeah. right? And to be honest with you, when Workday first came, I was like, you know, we're finally hitting that hockey stick growth. Yeah. I don't think I want to sell right now. But after meeting with Workday and meeting with the executives, um, you know, and they told us, you know, this is not an Apple hire. We're not hiring you for your engineering team. We actually love your product. We love the, what you've been building. We love you guys as founders. And we, we want you to continue building this product here. And even still after that conversation, I was like, I don't know, like, we're doing pretty good right now. We don't, we don't, I think we're selling too early. Um, and then what kind of got me was one of the executives it was either an executive or somebody else, I can't remember, was like, hey, Han, why did you start Rally Team? And I was like, you know, to have an impact on the world, right? And then they asked him, was it for money? I'm like, no, it wasn't for money. It was to like change people's lives. And she made a really good point. She was like, well, right now you have about 100,000 users. So you're impacting, you know, tens of thousands of users. At Workday, we have 72 million users. And we want to make your platform core into our product wow. right so think about the impact you're having on the world now and then at that point i'm like damn so where did i sign <laughs> <laughs> you know like this is great because now the comp like what i'm learning from you is that you know you have this passion and passion this hustle this motivation the ability to like uh, accept sacrifice to do what you're supposed to do yeah. you know this shaped you as a you know, as a leader, as a mentor, like, what would you say to the next future leaders? 
how would you guide them to be better leaders? Oh, that's a really good question. You know, I what I would say is A, follow something you're passionate about. B, don't be afraid to take risks. I think a lot of people are always afraid to take risks. A lot of people are always afraid of, oh, what well, if I fail, I won't have a job. But all my, I, I grew up in Edmonton, Alberta. A lot of my friends who stayed in corporate, stayed in oil and gas, are unemployed. I should say a lot. There's a handful of them that are unemployed right now, and they took a safe path. Yeah. I didn't take a safe path, safe path and I'm doing okay. Yeah. Right. So, really, don't be afraid of taking risks. You know, understand the consequences, and then ask yourself, you know, is it really that bad? Right. And then the second thing for me is, um, if I know what my path is and I can predict it and I'm not happy with the outcome, change it. So for example, when I was working in energy, I knew exactly what my career was gonna look like. If I stayed another two years, I'd become a VP. If I stayed another four years, maybe an SVP, I'd still be living in Houston. You know, I'd be working for a man, I'd be working in the corporate world, doing something that I'm not passionate about. I could predict that and I knew that's not what was gonna make me happy, mm -hmm. right? And if you can predict the same thing and it doesn't make you happy, make a change, do something else. So how did you get, okay, so, a lot of leaders do, do say that, Yeah. right? Yeah. And you hear it all over in the internet and yeah. also Instagram and stuff like that. But how did you win the hearts of people to follow you? Like, what did you do? How did you get three of your, <laughs> your uh, team, <laughs> teamers here? Like, like, um, I think it's just, you know, it's interesting when we were first hiring people, we can offer very high salaries and I wanted to hire the best. So I, I came up, I came up here and I was like recruiting and two of the people that I hired, they were going to go to Google to make twice as much. Yeah. This is Google. And, um, I think the reason why they chose to, to come to rally team was because of a, my vision, right? How, and I think that's really important in a, in a leader is to be able to have a strong vision share it with other people, right? Get people to kind of make their, that vision their own and come on board with you, right? I think it's really important for a leader to be able to like sell that vision, right? And then secondly, um, you know, just being genuine and having commitment. I, I told these guys that my goal, if you guys come on to Rally Team, my goal is to give you the best experience possible and I hope one day that you'll look back at this, this experience and say, this was the best job I ever had, right? And that's still my commitment, even to these guys here, right? Um, and I think just being genuine and having that strong vision is, uh, like for me at least, I would follow you with that. So do you think your deep voice has anything to do with you? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my voice is only really high. No, it's, it, you know, this is great. Um, okay, so, now you're you're back, you're up in Vancouver, yeah, right, uh, with your wife and, yeah. and daughter. Can you share with us that that moment when you shared with your wife? Yeah, that honey, you don't have to cut your hair anymore. Oh you yeah, like, oh, oh my god, she was so happy. Like she was just like we went out. I, I can't, we went out for dinner. We got super drunk. <laughs> and then, uh, the, the crazy thing is we were in that staying a hotel yeah. because the con we had moved back to Canada and we we're actually staying um, uh, at an apartment near her sister's place in Calgary. We we're just there temporarily. And then the apartment there was fire burned down. <laughs> and so we had to we we had to move to a hotel. So we were living in a hotel. And then so the moment uh, I got confirmation that the deal is done, we went out, celebrated, got drunk, came back home, woke up the next morning, called all my friends at Calgary, I said, this hotel's got an outdoor pool, we're having a pool party. <laughs> <laughs> Invited all my friends in Calgary, yeah. and we just just threw the biggest party ever. Yeah. Yeah, so it, 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 was, it was a good time, and um, it was a relief. Like, even though initially I didn't want to sell the company, it was, like near the end, it was such a relief because I was like, I don't know how it's going to juggle having company yeah. and also having a kid, yeah. right? Because now that I have a kid, I'm like, I don't think I could do a startup anytime soon because any minute that I spend on a startup, I'd be losing with my kid. Yeah. And any minute that I spend on my kid, I'd be losing with my startup. So my startup would probably fail. Yeah. So the timing was actually perfect. So you flew everyone 
from Calgary to Vancouver. Uh, uh, well, yeah. yeah so yeah, Vancouver? yeah. I flew to Family out to Vancouver. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, how good our time? I'm good. Yeah. All right. Okay. So last question. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm gonna hopefully it's a good one. Uh, my question to you would be. Okay. My next one would be, when your daughter grows older. Yeah. And she's in high school. How would you, what would you say to her that can encourage her to pursue her dreams? Oh man, these are really good questions. <laughs> um, I think I would just tell her that A, though she doesn't necessarily have to follow like the traditional path of going to university, right? I said I would say it's more important to kind of you know know the direction you're going first before you start like paying for it, right? So first thing um, I'd have her do after high school is take a year off, a gap year, and just travel, right? Learn about herself, uh, learn about what she's passionate about, learn about what she, what she wants to do, right? And I would just tell her that anything is really possible, right? If there's somebody who's done it in this world, what, why do you think that you can't do it, right? There's so many good examples of people who came from nothing and made something huge of themselves, right? You're not different from that, right? You can you can do that same thing if you kind of follow similar patterns, right? Build some strong connections and just be passionate about what you're pursuing and work hard towards that goal, right? And unlike my parents who were very like typical Asian, you need to be a doctor, there's no other option. And when I transferred to engineering, they were like, oh my God, <laughs> you know? And my, now my sister, she's going to be a doctor, doctor. She's doing her PhD. <laughs> and then she's going to go into medical doctor, into medicine. And they're like, so happy. <laughs> but even like, yeah, so like, my parents were very strict. They were like, you know what? You got to study hard. You can't play, play any sports in school, right? I think you're so big. So, <laughs> sorry. You know, yeah, just like, yeah, yeah. So I, did, I didn't listen to them. So I, I used to be really athletic up till high school in grade 10, and then my parents, uh, I made all the teams while my parents never signed the permission forms, and they're like, nope, it's time to like, you know, optimize for university, yeah. right? So instead of like volleyball or football, we want you to do speech and debate and do this, right? <laughs> and so I think for my daughter Haley, I would just be like, I think it's actually really important to be in team sports, yeah. because um, it's so, having good team skills is such a critical such a critical skill to have a startup. Yeah. I've seen more startups fail because of co-founder conflict yeah. or because they can't retain a, a team, huh. right? And I think, you know, your success is really dependent on your team success, yeah. right? So you gotta be able to like work with people, attract people, and, um, and yeah, just be a good team player. So I would say, you know what, play a lot of sports, you know, do a lot of uh, different things. High school is a time when you should be discovering yourself. Right, not just being, not just optimizing in math, yeah. right? And then once you kind of like figure out what you want to do, um, if she's anything like me, I'm very analytical, right? I analyze, uh, it takes me like forever to buy clothes because I always think, okay, where am I gonna wear this? What's this made out of? Like I analyze everything, but with a startup, you can analyze the crap out of it and never do anything because you're stuck in analysis paralysis. Yeah. At some point, you just gotta close your eyes and take the leap. Yeah. Right, and that's what I'm gonna tell her is like, you know, nothing's ever gonna feel 100, yeah. percent right? But don't get trapped there, don't get stuck there. Just close your eyes, take the leap. A, if you fail, try something else. That's good. Just so that you guys didn't realize, I was actually asking that question for you. <laughs> what he just said isn't necessarily for his daughter, but it's also for anyone here who wants to start their own vision. So, so thank you. Yeah. Except for these guys. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much.